Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison, for what is the first in our series of the best of Happiness Is podcast. What's been going on? Well, we've got some new episodes coming up for your listening pleasure and for some of you, your viewing pleasure. But in the meantime, what happens at the end of a calendar year? We stick stuff together and we call it a best of. And the first one that we're going to kick off with is the 2014 England Women's World Cup winning squad. We've spoken to amazing people all the way through this first batch of podcasts and none more so than the wonderful Tamara Taylor, the most capped England international Rocky Clark and the woman who seems to be going about changing the face of the game as we know it, Rachel Burford. We're going to put their stories together for you, for me to get back into the game and then we'll see you very, very soon for the next batch of pods. My name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast, and I hope you enjoy. Love that. So a World Cup, two two goals and it, you didn't win it. Were, was the plan before each of them to win it? Was, I'll tell you what, that, that would have been nice. Would have made things so much easier. But uh, yes, it was very much so. So I got capped in 2003 and went to my first World Cup in 2006. And the experience was epic like I've been with all my sort of childhood heroes and I was now I was now part of the team and I'd, I'd been in there for a few years so I've got in there sort of socially as well and you know one of the girls used to say um oh, you can't speak to you've had 10 caps I was like all right so um wench being a bit um having a bit of banter or Karen Andrew um and so I was sort of firmly in there and we were out in Canada you know, really, really tough games. And yeah, we just, we lost to New Zealand in the final and that, that was so hard. And I tell you what, that was one, of, ironically, the worst days of my life. I felt like my heart had shattered into like a million pieces. And, and I was just like, I'm going to the next one and we're going to win this. Obviously, roll on four years. We'd, um, we kept quite a few of the squad. There's some of the older states women had, had gone, but we'd, um, we regrouped and set and, and it was in obviously London and we were like oh this is amazing home crowds like the game had started really getting momentum now and uh, lots of support I've got my 50th cap running out for the first game um, against USA in the uh, opening game in 2010 had a really good tournament and then played New Zealand and just in that last little bit they got a penalty and, and won 13-10 and that was that was heartbreak, but of a different kind. And that's why I talk about 2014, because I, I, I would have put my house on 2010 with a one. 2014, I was like, well, there's no more to go. We, we'd done everything we could and we just, we knew we could win, but we also knew about five other teams could win as well. So it was, um, it was a case of us just obviously playing each game as it came and, and getting through. And, and it was, it was, you know, amazing experience and and one why I wouldn't, so many people asked me why I didn't retire then. And I was like, well, I love it. I'm still enjoying it. Like, why would I? So I obviously carried on to the 2017 one. And um, unfortunately we we're on the, the, the loss that time, but nothing will ever take away the the, the gold medal that I've got. Um, and, you know, one out of four ain't bad. So yeah. And, and the amazing experiences and things I've achieved along the way and, winning grand slams and Europeans and things like that. You can't, you can't knock it. Have you read Catherine Spencer's book? I've, I actually, I've had, I've got it on my reading list to do, but I'm, I'm so that's no, about. so that's no, no don't give no, me no, this no, excuse. No, no, she's one of my good mates and I've got it on my reading list to do. So fingers crossed, I'll get it. I, I must admit, I'm really not a reader, but I, I promise, and I will say this publicly, I will have read it by the end of the year, but I very much support it. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad. Well, did you pay for your copy? Um, no, I'm waiting for a free one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I support it, but I need a free one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, we're, we're getting a real insight into That's the real hard. Rocky Clark here. I, I use carrier bags as boot bags. Come on. <laughs> In that, she talks about she didn't get that chance. She didn't get to go back and win it and there were there were obviously players from the two previous tournaments who didn't get to 
to be there. Did your phone go nuts beforehand with go on, do it for me as well? Or did it go nuts afterwards with uh, congratulations, I'm so happy? Did those players stay involved in the process? Yeah, we had um, we had quite a lot of the players that had, had come out, which was really, really nice. And and it was really um, it was really hard. One of our best friends had just been had got all the way up to the tournament, and then the the um, team had sort of trimmed down. And unfortunately, she wasn't a part of it. But it was amazing to still have her out there, Georgina Gulliver, one of my best mates, and part of the Spice Girls group. That's what we used to do as well: call ourselves the Spice Girls and muck about. But um, yeah, and those girls are out there, like Amy Garnet, um, some of the old old girls were there, like TJ, um, Jenny Sutton, just, and they were, like, the embrace they gave us, uh, Rob Clayton, the embrace they gave us, like, when we got off the off the coach and just, like, hugged us so tightly because they were so proud because, you know, some of them lived on with us and Katie McLean's um, speech afterwards it wasn't just the you know the 22 that took to the field it was it was doing it for all the players that had gone before us and it and that that really is true and um i'm hoping although it's very very difficult for those players to to not get that chance equally hopefully they feel something um that we did it for them as well i just got shivers in the back of my neck there when you were talking about them giving you the big embrace because i love that emotional connection so so when you I hear that and I try and pick those bits out. There's one of them that sticks out for me. Now, I listened to Johnny Wilkinson talk about the World Cup final and he said he would give anything for the last, I think it was 15 seconds of the game because that was the feeling. Knowing we were in control, knowing we are in the moment. When the whistle went, obviously you celebrated and you were happy. And I think he was trying to get at that then the feeling was on its way down. How did you feel in those final seconds getting towards that final whistle? Can you remember or is it just all imagining what you felt like? Oh, I felt hugely panicked, stressed and not in control at all. And I remember Canada making a break past the halfway line and I was like, oh my God, we're going to lose it. Even though theoretically we couldn't because there was only like, I don't know, a minute or so left and they'd have to score two tries. And um, so... I just remember the huge panic and I, I never gave up until that final whistle went um, and it was just scrambling panic to get back. Like, oh God, I don't want to be the reason we lose the World Cup. Like, you know, you just um, you, you just gave it everything. And back then we only had one prop on the bench. So I played the full game. And so I was like, hang in. Um, <laughs> but I was like, just keep going. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, it was it was pretty epic. Um, I'd probably go 15 seconds after the whistle had gone because the, the initial um, feeling after the whistle had gone was just relief. Uh, and just thank God we've done it rather than, you know, pure exhilaration that came laughter um once once it had sort of gone in i was running around swearing going, we've ever done it we've ever done it but initially yeah, i think i dropped on my knees and was just like oh my god i can't believe it and then yeah then all the the um excitement and and celebrating came and based on the previous experiences like you said it was third time lucky i suppose you plan for everything. You plan for if they have the ball in that space, we are here and here's how we defend. If we get the ball to that touchline, here's how we set up. You don't plan for what happens after the final whistle. Yeah, really good point, actually, because it, it just it just all like carried on this snowball effect. I didn't realise like how big it had got in the press. Um, and we were invited to so many things, um, which was just amazing and I remember my um, forwards coach Graham Smith at the time he was saying that I'd go to um, the opening of an envelope because I just said yes to everything <laughs> like it gave me a load of stick but I loved it I was I went to a Celine Dion concert I went to Lady Gaga I went to Wimbledon um, it was just so fantastic I just had the best time and I, I dined out on it as long as I could um, so yeah it was it was super and and I had my uh, had my medal on for ages. I remember like going up to a coaching session. I had it on underneath my top, and and it was it was just so good to to finally do it. Everything I've worked towards 
came together in that sort of 80 minute game. Be, and so the, the support of your teammates must have been crucial. And, and I know only through social media and, and speaking to people how close you are with lots of your England teammates who probably live quite far away. But because of the experiences you've gone through together, you've just become very, very close. Yeah, definitely. And some of that is about the good times and, you know, that World Cup squad from 2014. It's one of those things that you'll always be connected, even if all not all of those people were best friends with each other. Um, but you've still got that connection. We actually, we've got a WhatsApp group. I don't think everyone's still on it. I think a few people might have left. Um, <laughs> I put a message on there about um, Jamman, our old manager. Yeah. Um, and I was doing a little chat about her. So I wanted to like get a few stories from the girls and what could people remember. And then it sort of started this trickle of stories and people reminiscing on stuff. And it was so nice to be able to like rekindle some of those memories and, and share that. And they're the kind of things that when you've gone through certain experiences, good and bad, with a group of people, you can always go back to those people to kind of feel that emotion again. Uh, it's quite a special thing. Oh, it, it must be, and you know, people like me can can only dream. Would you would you have a Channel Four nine o'clock on a Thursday night hour long reunion show with all you coming back together, a bit like at the end of Ocean's an Ocean's Eleven movie where they all sort of walk back in? Could, That'd be amazing. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's. Amazing. I reckon we need oh, to make wow. that happen. I think that would just be so cool because those stories you've all gone to do. Some of you are still involved in rugby. Some of you have gone to be uh, professionals in other industries. Some of, you know, working for the RFU. Somebody like you is be at the top of the world and doing all sorts of other things. It would. Everybody has such an amazing story. The the professional players. It's easy to track. You know, the England squad of two thousand and three is is now almost twenty years ago, but they all kept being professional rugby players, whereas you guys have gone to do other things. I think it would be an amazing story to listen to. Right, get that sorted then, Bruce. That's your right. job. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's make it happen. The, so, the 2010 World Cup was, was obviously a big deal because it was so close and didn't quite happen. I, I used to say to players, there were, there were too many sleeps between the Saturdays because what if the Saturday had been a poor performance? You know, you could always kind of accept the result if you thought you'd done well, but there was, I always felt better after a Tuesday night training because I felt like, right, we've now had some real chance to input and make that thing better. Mm -hmm. To have to wait four years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I again, I can only imagine what what did that do to the team talks? What did that do to the training camps? What were you talking about? We need to win this, or did you wait until a bit like you're saying you were nervous? So did you never talk about it until that day or that week or after the semi final? How how did that four years pan out? That's quite a big question. How long that is got? a big question. <laughs> oh, we've got a long time, don't worry. Um, I think I think probably the, the first bit after the World Cup was everyone was devastated. You know, you had Catherine Spencer, who was a captain at the time, yeah. who retired not long after that. So for her, she never got that that chance to um, to try and have that like that four year. And I think for some people, depending on the circumstance they were in, it's probably one of those things that hangs over because it was so close and you know have you read Catherine's book yes. have you, uh, yeah because uh, it's it's obviously a huge part of not just her rugby life but her life mm. and all the things that that could have happened and and that's kind of why I asked because I've I've read Catherine's book and there's so much in it and I, she didn't get the chance that others got to not right or wrong but get the chance to almost put it to bed a little bit yeah definitely and there's you know obviously as, as captain I think you probably take that a bit harder but there's there's a whole bunch of players that that was that 2010 was there right I'm gonna do this this is the one I think I think for Amy Garner it was third time lucky kind of thing um and then she retired not long afterwards so it was yeah it was really really sad for quite a period of time and um it took us a while, I think, as a squad to 
get back into it. But the good thing was we kept quite a large number of those players. Mm -hmm. So as you kind of build through the seasons leading into the next World Cup, there was this kind of, we need to make this right. Whatever happens, we've got to make sure like we beat New Zealand. For me personally, everything that I did was about beating New Zealand. When we when we beat whoever by however many points, I'd be like, yeah, but would that have been New Zealand? Yeah. <laughs> and if I was training, I used to go um, training at the beach. So there's quite a steep staircase and I'd go and like run the steps and stuff. And I'd be like, absolutely hanging. <laughs> yeah. But are the Kiwis doing this? Um, they probably were. I've no <laughs> idea. But um, I got a bit obsessed with like their top because they've just been so dominant for so long. Yeah. Um, it was just the dream to be like, right, we're going to take them on and we're going to beat them. Like, th this is all that matters. We've got to beat them. So for me personally, it was a little bit obsessive. I'm not sure how everyone else was. <laughs> <laughs> and then to, to win the World Cup, I, I listened to a podcast Johnny Wilkinson was on and, and I loved this because until he'd said it, I had thought it but didn't know what to say. What are you talking about, Bruce? He, he said he would give anything to be in the last 15 seconds of the game again because that was not necessarily his happy place, but that was where everything was okay. You know, he was in the middle of a rugby field. It was the World Cup final, and he was confident that what they had done was going to pay off in the end, more so than the final whistle or the celebrations. And I've... I've been in games where I didn't want the whistle to blow. You know, it's that I, I don't let the music stop kind of idea. What was it for you in 2014? World Cup final, everything that happened four years before, all the work that you'd done, and then it happens. What Do you know what was going on or can you only know what's going on by reflecting back on it? Um, I know that when the whistle went, <clears throat> I was just, it was overwhelming relief. There wasn't a, we've won the world. There wasn't jumping around Johnny Wilkinson style, like we've won the World Cup. Um, I was just like, thank God, it away. thank God we've won it. Thank, oh my God. We have like, literally just thank God. I think there's a picture of me just stood. So a load of the girls have like come together in a huddle and I'm sort of stood like, facing away from them and then uh, my roommate Keats, Laura Keats, comes over and we have a hug and then we're like, we need to join everyone! <laughs> um, and like bundle on the back of this pylon. Um, but even when, so Skaz scores that second try and a few people have said, oh, that's when I knew we could win, like I knew we were far enough ahead. But even when she scored that, I was like, right, come on, like we've just got to keep fighting. Just don't let them in, don't let them in, don't let them into our 22. Okay, they're in our 22, don't let them pass our <laughs> Um just, just, yeah, I think for me it was, because it was my third one, you know, you have all those those memories from the previous ones and, and games that you've lost and when you know that you could have or should have won, in, you know, in your head. Um, and I just didn't want this one to slip away. So I think... It was really nice that I was still on the pitch um, to be able to have that maybe that last 15 minutes of feeling like I was impacting it and it was OK yeah. um, because the other all my other World Cup finals, I've been taken off for that last whatever that period of time is and lost and watched us losing and felt really helpless. So it was nice to be able to feel like. I was still there and able to impact if anything, not that anything was going wrong, but if it was, to feel like I could I could try and help. <laughs> and then the the, the knock-on of that, you, you got to go to number 10, you know, you were a you were a World Cup winner. What what was the thing or what happened or where were you or who did you speak to when you, you sort of thought, hang on a minute, I'm Tamara Taylor, World Cup winner, and I've just done that thing. When did you have a moment? Or did it just all flow and seem like, yeah, this is how, this is how it goes? <laughs> really? um, it's quite weird because we we obviously didn't have the the sort of like the big fanfare and the opened up bus and all that. And I'm not saying you need that, but I think that kind of elongates the feeling of you're a World Cup winner, doesn't it? In the in the kind of public domain, and we we did some really cool stuff that you would never have had the opportunity to do, like go to the prime minister's house um and things like that but in between i went back to work um and a lot of the girls had to go back to work like the teachers and stuff um yeah. so you were almost like it was a strange feeling i wore my medal non-stop for seven days and seven nights 
Um, so I was still wearing it on a day I went into work. We had this like all, I think it was like a Norse get together of all the, the community coaches. <clears throat> so I had it on underneath um, and I'm just like almost in the same kit because I was working for the RFU. So I'm almost putting my, my kit back on, but going into work with my medal on, like they're just like tucked in. Um, and one of the boys was super excited and like picked me up and like dragged me into the classroom that we're in. And then was like, you're wearing a medal. Like he got super excited. But then I was quite embarrassed because I didn't want everyone to be staring at me and like to cause a big scene because it was work. I was in work mode. Yeah. Um, so bits like that were, it was just a bit surreal to be like, oh my God, last week I was winning a World Cup and now I'm. It was back at work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but probably the most amazing bit that we got to do was the Sports Personality of the Year Awards. Yeah. Um, I've watched that like religiously every year as a kid I just loved it I loved like I just loved everything about it all the good stories that you got all the the athletes that got to be celebrated so when we were there I was like oh, we're here we've been nominated I was like a proper little school girl wandering around like that's blah blah that's blah blah um and then the fact that we won it was yeah just absolutely amazing to be able to go on stage and and afterwards, because you're in a in the after party with all the athletes and like the VIPs and the special people, and normally <laughs> you're you know you're one of the starstruck people, and we were all wearing um, the same sort of outfit, so we yeah. we looked like a team. Um, so when we were wandering around, even in our little pods of people afterwards, people knew who we were and were coming up and congratulating us, and that was yeah, that was a really nice feeling to be almost all of us all together we were only missing one player um that evening to have everyone back together and have another little joint celebration together that that wasn't me i can remember that and i can remember so many people just willing you to win that because far too often female athletes or teams have been overlooked and to have you all on stage was a real moment for for the sport for rugby for women's sport for it was just such a big deal and I think it's funny when you say behind with all the special people you are the special <laughs> people you were world cup winners that was just outstanding now, oh, uh, the one the other bit I want to talk to you about is England and it obviously meant a huge amount to you and you had some tough times leading up to the big success when you look back on that that journey how does that feel I genuinely think like the the tougher times help shape and define you and you learn so much from it and I think without those times you don't really know who you are as an individual and a team um and again it's a little bit like the the Saracens um game and a bit like when we went into 2014 it was like there was nothing that was ever going to stop us and there's that 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 feeling inside and I've only had that twice um no three times I've had that I had that in um 2014 I had that in 2017 when we won the league and we had it in 2021 when we won the league it's just there's something that you can feel that you can't explain that you just know it's gonna it's gonna happen and and they were the three times that I felt like that that was a hell of a squad of players that, that you had with England to, to do that. And, you know, so many of them now are, are role models. And, and if they were coming around now, their life would probably be quite different. But the challenges they experienced to get to that point brought you closer together, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we talk about 2014, yeah? Yeah. And, yeah. So if you look back at that year before, we had probably one of the worst seasons ever. So we were split at that time. We were doing sevens. So I was like a part-time. There was, I think, I think the entire back line was, apart from maybe one or two, was doing part-time sevens for half of that year. So we didn't play in the Six Nations, um, which is the year that Ireland won the Six Nations. And I think we finished fourth. So we had that bad time. The sevens, we didn't fulfill what we should have done there either. We came sixth or fifth. I think we came fifth. Um, when we should have been in kind of a medal. Well, no, it wasn't, wouldn't have been a medal, just be one medal as well cup. <laughs> um, so we did really badly at that. Then literally the sevens girls, we got back from Moscow 
Sevens World Cup, um, and five days later, um, if even it was that, it might have been less, we got on a plane to go to New Zealand to go on a, a three-test tour in New Zealand. Bear in mind, we hadn't played 15s. We hadn't been with the squad, with the team, anything. Um, we got on the plane, went to New Zealand. We lost in New Zealand 3-0, um, and like badly in terms of the first one got away from our second one we we had won the game but it was New Zealand and the clock was in red and Portia Wildman ran the length and then killed all our dreams off so like we had such a bad build-up into that that season and that year um and then all of a sudden like all of those moments led to us getting closer as a group so even though it was really bad on pitch against in New Zealand the closeness that brought us together off the pitch it was one of the best tours for that um and I think you know those defeats bringing us closer together trying to figure things out and work things out together because it's easy when things are going well right and you don't really reflect as much um but when things aren't going right you really have to kind of dig deep into it and I think that kind of was what set us on to for the rest of the season um I'm pretty sure but we lost the Six Nations in 2014 so it's almost like and then every year where we've won everything so so that's the contrast we lose everything going into 2014 win the World Cup we then win everything in 2020 <laughs> autumn Six Nations we go to New Zealand beat New Zealand and then we lose at the World Cup so my advice this year <laughs> At least maybe lose one game. <laughs> yeah, have, have a stinker. And the, Ian McGeekin, on one of his speeches to the Lions, talks about you'll meet each other in 30 years' time and there'll just be a look. Is that what it's like with that group? Yeah, and I think that came alive when we went to the Houses of Parliament and the 1994 squad was there. And they and Jill Burns was like no matter what happens in life, this group has something special, something in common that nobody can ever take away from you. And I think that was the real realisation. Um, and now you can kind of look around when, you know, likes of you know, all the players that were involved, you can think of them and know that we did something collectively special that we'll have forever. No one can take that away from you. And I think that's the look, that's the thing where you can go in a room and be like, yeah, we did that without even needing to say it or talk about it. Yeah, well, on that note, I've spoken to Rocky and Tamara and I'm trying to pitch to Channel 4 for uh, bringing the squad, a bit like the Friends reunion. Oh, but yeah. I, but I get to be James Corden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so that, that's the only bit. Are we doing bit karaoke as well? Oh, well, yes. We could pick everybody up on the way, right? This is maybe going to have to be longer than an hour show. Maybe it could be yeah. a six-part series. Are you going to need to get a mini bus? I think it's going to have to be an open top bus for you. <laughs> <laughs> and you you could be in Very charge amazing. of you could be in charge of hydration. Oh yeah, I'm good at that. <laughs> I am Polish after all, so <laughs> that's where the vodka roots come from. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the very first in the best of series from the Happinesses podcast. Three magnificent people who have done great things in the game. And I've got absolutely no doubt are going to continue to do that. Tamara over in Sweden. Rocky still charging around the paddock and holding up the scrum. And Berth is back. Look out because the Harlequin women are trying to win it again. If you enjoyed that, please go back and listen in the archives to the full episodes of all three of those people. Great stories, great fun, and some pretty emotional moments in there too. If you enjoyed it, please tune in and register and subscribe and tell your friends and do all those things for Apple, Acast and Spotify. You can also watch on Facebook and YouTube. My name is Bruce Aitchison. My happiness is egg-shaped. Tell your friends because we'll be back with lots more exciting episodes in the Happinesses podcast series. For now, stay safe.